Welcome to What to Watch with me, Toby Earl, the show which is a big fan of Stephen Merchant's latest work. No, not Fighting with My Family, starring Dwayne Johnson, but the short film Merchant made outlining the glamour of Hollywood. Until this show earns the right to be written on an ironing board, we'll speak to the most glamorous stars off the glitziest screen in the corner of the room or in your rocks. Coming up on the show today, Billy Zane puts his foot down, not because he's cross, but because he's racing in new futuristic adventure, Curfew. Emma Appleton and Cara Horgan are traitors. No, no, they're in traitors the new espionage thriller set in post-war London, where a civil servant is persuaded to spy on the British government by an American agent. New comedy drama Flack centers on the lies of a top team of PR executives and stars Lydia Wilson as the fearsome Eve, who's killing it when it comes to PR. And I'll give you my top TV picks of the week, the shows which, if you miss, will make you lonelier than opportunity the Mars rover that spent 15 years on the red planet and is now lost there, unable to communicate with NASA. Sweet dreams, Oppie. Australia is a continent full of scary creatures, though none perhaps as troubling as a hermit crab using a doll's head for a shell. <coughs> Someone who might be able to confirm this is Julia Bradbury, who's travelled over 7,000 miles across the country for her new ITV series, Australia, on ITV, Thursday at half past eight. This, this is no holiday, though. She works at a cattle ranch, collects crocodile eggs, and, toughest of all, attends a surfing school for dogs. <laughs> There's a surfing, ch an ex-surfing champ called Chris, who now is a sort of a doggy therapist trainer, and he's he's taken the rather unusual step of training dogs on surfboards. So when I met him, which is just around a, a cove from Manly Beach, mm. uh, just uh, just outside Sydney or part of Sydney, um, he he rocked up on a skateboard with a dog wrapped around his shoulders <laughs> and two dogs running beside him. So I knew straight away that this was the that's right the man. That's, that's the guy I'm interviewing about surfing dogs. And then we had this very funny conversation about why surfing and dogs work so well and why does it help them for, um, from a training point of view. And he talked about rewards and treats and all the rest of it. And I was like, OK, fine, can we just do this? And then um, I had a go at paddleboarding and he gave me one of the more docile dogs <laughs> uh, who sat very obligingly at the front of the paddleboard. And I was like, trying to, I haven't done a lot of paddleboarding. So I desperately tried not to fall over and make an idiot of myself and paddleboarded with this dog. And of course, we had the onboard surfing doggy cam. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was incredible and Chris uses this as a technique he said that once you've trained the dog to sit there and, and to listen to command their treat because of course dogs work on yeah. reward and treat reward and treat um, their treat is right you can jump into the water and you know they have a little doggy paddle little swim and then they get to the beach and they can run along the beach with other doggies and that's why it works as a training technique bizarrely part of your travels is looking at how Australia has been affected by uh, global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it. I mean, wh wh however you wish to term it. Yeah. But the, term, but, but what, what, you know, the changes to the environment. There are, there are three striking things uh, that, that you see in the series. First of all is the loss of wildlife habitat. So the loss of forest um, and other wildlife mm -hmm. habitat because man is just spreading, uh, including in Australia. So koalas, koala bears that, we, that are famous the world, the world over, they're on the brink of being endangered. But, but we're getting closer and closer. Man is getting closer and closer to wildlife. So that's, uh, and wildlife is having to adapt to us encroaching on on their space so that's very apparent in um in australia i visited a turtle sanctuary in cairns uh, called the cairns turtle Reca rehab uh, center set up by an amazing woman called jenny gilbert and she just rehabilitates turtles that are that all of them are under threat because of plastic pollution or they've been hit by boats or they've been caught entangled in fishing nets and and uh, and man made pollution in the oceans yeah. the research has shown that the first thing you have to do is make people care, make them relate to that as an issue. And conservation and climate change and deforestation is a very difficult thing to relate to if, if it's not part of your everyday life. 
Um, but there are certain things that are happening in the world today that we can highlight and we can, we can make the younger generation mm. relate to straight away. What all the scientists say we've got 11 or 12 years to halt climate change, whatever you think climate change might be. And it's complicated. It is deforestation. It is pollution. It is CO2 emissions. It's a combination of things. It's not one thing. Mm. If we all gave up plastic straws tomorrow, that's not going to halt climate change. If we all switch to electric cars tomorrow, that's not going to halt climate change. It's a very complex net of things that we have to do, but it has to be a global plan. Now for what we call WTW, PC, T, Q, O, T, every week, W. What to watch is pop culture Twitter quote of the week. What's a celebrity said on Twitter <laughs> this week? A great way to keep asparagus fresh and make it last longer in the fridge once cleaned, prepped, is to put it in water like flowers. Hashtag prep on. Tweeted orange is the new black actress and inadvertent cheapskate inspiration, Laura Prepon. With a vague resemblance to unopened flowers, skin flint partners may lavish asparagus on their loved ones instead of actual blooms, saving money but earning the same credit. It's almost the thought that counts. Despite the reams of gossip magazine pages and the acres of internet devoted to salacious rumour, the best stories about celebs are the ones you never hear. That said, have you heard about... No? Absolutely not, say the lawyers. The best stories are the ones you never hear because of the PR executives and crisis management specialists we meet in FLAC, the new comedy drama starting on W this Thursday at 10pm. Lydia Wilson stars as Eve, who has a turn of phrase deadlier than a firing squad. And we discussed how Eve is built from real life. Each episode, I think, is meant to sort of like cumulatively just like go beyond where you think someone would go in the name of the job. So by episode six, it's like sort of nauseatingly. Really? Yeah. How did, and did you, you felt you felt nauseated? Well, just that <laughs> sort of like the, bl the blur between what's professional and what's personal when you're dealing with the entertainment industry is so complicated. And I think it was, like Ollie's scripts are almost an exercise in like how far can we push it? and push it and push it. Sort of Black Mirror-ish in a way, that idea of taking reality and then going, this is the logical conclusion of, of what we set up here. Like, I went and sat in a PR, um, amazing PR agency that let me sit in for a day and I was exhausted by midday. It was like the pace at which these guys were walking, talking, meeting, digesting, everything was happening in real time. The news was, you know, always changing and stuff. And that made, gave me just an insight into how tired Eve must be a lot of the time, you know? And then how she like drinks and parties her way to kind of keep the adrenaline going. And what I found interesting is that the people that I interviewed were obviously like super savvy and really um, not like the characters in AbFab. But when I made that reference, they were like, yes, we love AbFab and whatever you do, you can never do too much. Like almost unanimously, every PR agent I met was like, go for it, babes. Like they really wanted <laughs> to see them sort of like, because I think it might not be every day, but stuff that's as extreme in the show actually happens in real life too. The thing that scared me was hearing the, um, that, that narratives that can be sort of predetermined in the press and it's just a question of when that person is going to have their fall from grace or the sort of soap opera part of it. It's not, you know, the whole of the press industry. It doesn't operate like, like that. But I, I saw an aspect of it. If people find out this is pumped full of toxins as the rest of us, browned Um, I've been surprised at how affectionate people <laughs> feel towards <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. I think maybe she represents the, um, the inner, inner voice that a lot of people don't like to um, let out. She's not, she's not a good girl. Um, and so it's kind of delicious. And she's always got a ready response to things, which I think a lot of, a lot of us fantasize about. She does Kundalini, so What's yin that? and yang. Oh, um, it's, it's really beautiful kind of yoga where you <laughs> stimulate the Kundalini. <laughs> is the idea of this coiled snake of energy at the base of your spine. Right. And this yoga uses a lot of repeated movements and breath um, to stimulate that. So it's a, one of the beautiful paradoxes of Eve, is yeah. that she's, um, she's a yogi as well as a... 
but that does mean she has a snake inside her, <laughs> which is also fitting. We, I, I, there, was a, there was a line in the show that I, I really like, which was, um, I think Sophia Canedo delivers it, yes. I, I believe, and she says, the world keeps turning, we just push. Yeah, it's chilling. Isn't it? Yeah. Does it feel funny to think about how the, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, how the narratives in which we think to be news or re yeah. personal revelations are in fact just marketing exercises? Yeah, yeah. And is that chicken and egg thing? Because if you stopped pushing, then maybe the world would change. But that whole, it's very our generation, I think that's sort of apathetic, like what I do isn't going to make a difference. Or, you know, if I recycle my thing, the restaurant down the road isn't recycling, so it can't, you know, I'm just a drop in the ocean. And that attitude is quite defining of our I feel at least in my experience and um, it's not so responsible maybe to think that way. Welcome back to What to Watch with me Toby Earl. The show that aims to guide you through your week's viewing and give you a glimpse behind the scenes and here from the stars. Coming up, I'll give you the TV picks of the week, which are almost as good as a dog owner following her corgi to discover where it spends its nights and finding out it was sneaking away for rides on a pony. But first, in new action thriller Curfew, we are plunged into a Britain even more unsettling than one where it's government policy to eat mouldy jam. This Friday, racers take their position on the starting grid in South London on Sky One at 9pm to participate in an illegal street race where victory is freedom from a totalitarian state. In this blend of the purge and the gumball rally, garnished with 28 Days Later, Billy Zane stars as flamboyant risk-taker Joker Jones. And Zane shared how he was always a part of the show, even if he didn't know it. With the, with the script, I mean, what did you make of it when you first saw it? This kind of this this idea of um, this race and the kind of the the influences that it wears on its sleeve, quite ha and like quite cheerily too. I mean, it's, oh, in a it's a real celebration. It's, it's, it completely celebrates, uh, you know, beyond guilty pleasure, um, a love of all things '70s and '80s cinema. Um, you know, your favorite kind of John Carpenter movies, which always managed to balance action and drama and comedy and horror. Um, we, we really tackle a lot of those things and, uh, you know, testament to our writers and, uh, and directors who, you know, pulled it off and, um, and delivered us upon those shores. And these actors who grounded it with fabulously um, poignant and, and very real performances within a very absurd, high jack, you know, completely jacked setting. Way back, you re you're in Twin Peaks. Working from that to something like this, does it feel like TV has come a considerable distance in, in how it is regarded? Um, with the reference that you made with Twin Peaks, it sounds like it went full circle to some degree. However, relatively speaking to most offerings, um, or at least what, the, you know, series television was like even five years ago, to. Um, Yes, for, for sure. You've seen, you know, all the writers flock that way. So the material is great. Actors you'd normally see in features are, you know, pining to get on great series. And the budgets are, you know, greater than most independent films because they are making a lot of money on these platforms. So it's a, it's a race to the top in a weird way. Um, and it's just fun to be part of it. It's a, we're in a very interesting renaissance of storytelling. Um, on television and you know the folks at Sky have been phenomenal by one embracing this particular story and helping develop and nurture it over time until it was you know perfect and, the, and again it's high risk high reward not many people would have gotten it or made it I think it had to be done in England which you know has always set the bar on on balancing you know great drama and legitimate cool and great music taste I think it could have been made in the States, not to disparage, you know, but I, I loved filming in Manchester. I'm a huge fan of post-punk and everything that came out of there. So the bones of this was mm. rooted in, you know, rock and roll, but we brought a bit of Western swagger and a bit of cowboy into the mix. It was funny when I, I, I got a lovely letter from, from Colm, who was directing the pilot, and he was like, well, you know, they were, they were building this on their passions. He and Matthew, the, the writer, were just trying to figure out, you know, like, what their favorite movies were. But he, he was, 
you know, I forget what some of those movies mean to people, be it Back to the Future, or, you know, mm. Demon Knight, or, you know, whatever. And, or The Phantom. And yeah. he, uh, he was saying, you know, we were, we were crafting Joker to be kind of a Billy Zane type. And I was like, what the hell is that? You know, and he was like, and we didn't think we'd get you. So I was like, well, <laughs> well, dude, call me. Don't let anyone play me. That's fantastic. So we just, we just added, you know, extra sauce and, uh, Bizarre. We got this cheeseburger called Joker Jones. Do you, are you saying you added extra Zane to the to I Billy don't, Zane? No, I, you did, and I'm, I'm not gonna. I can only refer <laughs> to myself in the third person one time. <laughs> and now for the TV news in briefs. It's the end of the world, and there's a specific date for it news. Fantasy adventure Good Omens will manifest on Prime Video on the 31st of May. Michael Sheen and David Tennant starring as odd couple Angel, Raphael, and Demon Crowley, who try to prevent the end of days. Would anyone notice if it did happen? That was the TV news. Briefs. Now, stop wondering if this school production of James and the Giant Peach ever realised the peach resembles... not a peach, because it's time for my TV picks of the week. Whitehall chaos might be all the rage these days, yet new espionage thriller Traitors shows post-war London has a strong claim on starting this trend. Emma Appleton and Cara Horgan star in Channel 4's new Sunday night drama as civil servants Fief and Ray. Although, Fief is operating as a mole for an American spook. The pair came in for interrogation and they spoke about insecurity, rebellion and the strong message the series has for today. The way I saw it when I first read the script, especially with the character of Fief, is she really believes she's on the right side of history as well. and. She strongly believes that it's she's with the good guys fighting the bad guys, and it's over the course of this that she realised there isn't good people and bad people. Mm. There are just people that make good and bad decisions, um, and everyone has the capacity for that, which is really quite fascinating for mm. me to kind of like go through as a, a journey. Yeah, everyone's just working within the framework of their own ideologies mm. and trying their best in just the most stressful situation, mm -hmm. which is what makes it kind of a good ingredient of time for a, for a drama, because we hear a lot about what happened during the war, but I certainly hadn't heard very much about what happened in that period just after the war, mm -hmm. which to me is actually in many ways more interesting, mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. when people are finding, finding their feet in trying to reassess who they are, yeah. having survived, and survival mm -hmm. is a really huge theme in our show. Every character is just doing what they can to survive, really. Absolutely. Um, as best they can without mm -hmm. compromising themselves too much. Mm -hmm. and, and with the stakes being so much higher all the time as well, it's this idea that it's very, very close. We read about war in the paper all the time and I think there's a sort of, um, there's a sense of like, well, that's happening over there and mm. we feel for those so people, but it feels far away. And mm. it was interesting to be in the mindset of it being incredibly close up and that you might go to work one day and some of your colleagues aren't there. Yeah. I wanted to serve my country. Bash Duran, who, who wrote it, writes incredibly in-depth characters, um, which I think, in a sense, we aren't really particularly used to an no, awful lot. Yeah, um, she gives us a lot to play with. Really? You know, every yeah. character's got a lot of um, backstory and a lot of history. Mm -hmm. and Do you have, mm -hmm. Does she give you a potted history, like, like notes to say yeah. who...? We got a sort of... We got a research pack, didn't we? Yeah, we, we got a research pack, and I remember spending time with her in the page turn mm -hmm. and just asking questions. Mm -hmm. Would she do this? How was, you know, how mm. was she brought up? Um, to the finest detail because mm. that all serves your character mm. and how they are and how they hold themselves yeah. and how they interact with people. I think the difference, slight difference, again, that might have to do with social class with my character is that there is something about her where she, she almost lacks the awareness, not in a stupid way, but she, she doesn't call into question that if she's a woman, that that's going to stop her doing what she wants to do. She, she d has this very strong rebellious spirit um, which causes her to just kind of barrel on forward and it's like, well, I'll stop when someone 
stops me, but I'm still going to keep pushing. My character's a mother, so she's very much thinking about what the world will be like for her son, and it feels very much like having survived uh, a period of time where lots of people died, your colleagues died, friends died, constant air raid uh, mm. sirens going off, and everybody living on the kind of precipice of that life and death, to then be thinking about rebuilding for the next generation and what world you want your children to exist in does feel quite relevant to now as mm. well, I think, mm -hmm. in, in America too, as well as the UK. Um, so I certainly felt reading it like this is the right time for a show like this to come out, to remind yeah. us that history in, in some regards does sort of repeat itself mm. and we're always forced to keep asking those, those questions about what world we mm. want our kids to mm -hmm. live in. All those GDPR pop-ups and emails might be annoying, but they are significantly preferable to the technological future in smart thriller Cypher on London Live this Sunday at 10pm. What Jeremy Northam uncovers when seeking a new career in corporate espionage is how employees have their identities altered without their knowledge, causing him to question not only who he's spying on, but also who he is. All too often overlooked, this is a minor sci-fi classic. So what do you do besides travel to dull cities and talk to women in hotel bars? Play golf. You're lying when you say that your name is Jack Thursby. You're lying when you say that you are not an undercover agent. You are lying when you say that you do not work for Digicore. That's it for this week. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll be back next week at 6.30 p.m. on Monday. Or watch the show streaming on London Live's Twitter at half past 12 Tuesday lunchtimes while you have a spot of lunch. I'll be back next Monday, so keep watching. <laughs>